So I am indeed Laura from Google, and we're going to talk today about distributed consensus. So where did this talk come from? The genesis of this talk was that in 2013, I joined Google. And I was also, at the time, working on a part-time master's thesis. And I needed a topic to write about. So I joined Google, and I noticed that basically every single system that we ran, from our very, very largest systems that were controlling all our jobs and storing all our data, to our very, very smallest little piece of automation, every single one of our systems was using distributed consensus. And as well as that, on the particular team that I joined in 2013, it was one of the ads data infrastructure teams. And the particular team that I was on was at the time it was transitioning from a pretty old and crusty version of a service that we ran to a much newer, shinier, re-architected one. And what this service did was it took logs of clicks and it joins them with information that we had previously logged about what was being clicked. And the old version of the system was a sort of a janky old pipeline, and whenever, whenever our, our data center was going to go down for maintenance, we had to sort of manually stop it in a graceful fashion and port over all the state and restart it again. Um, and that was pretty nasty. That was like a lot of manual toil. And as well as that, if, if this thing ever failed in production unexpectedly, I mean, we were just hosed. We just had to sort of recover state as best we could, and it was generally a mess. So this system was bad. It was so bad that we had done, you know, one of the very classic Google SRE things, which is to say, this system is so bad, developer team. It's so bad, and you guys aren't investing in it, so have the pager back until it's better. And then one of the very smartest SREs that I know worked on this new system with the developers in one of the best SRE engagements that I know about and produced this amazing system called Photon. So Photon did the same thing as the old janky um, kind of singly homed pipeline did, but it just did it so smoothly. And it did it so smoothly because at its core, it was running on distributed consensus. And I remember one day, and it was one of my very first weekends on call probably. I was at home, it was a Sunday afternoon, or Sunday morning in fact, and I was just, you know, I was, I was being very European. I was kind of having my coffee and my croissant and, you know, sort of enjoying the Sunday papers. And I get a ping from a colleague on another team. And this colleague said, Laura, when is your system going to be back up to date? And I went, oh, my God. I hadn't been paged. I didn't think anything was wrong. See, so yeah, I mean, ultimate SRE nightmare, right? Your system is broken. Somebody is going, when's your system going to be fixed? And you have no idea what's happening. So I went into my monitoring and I had a look. And sure enough, one of the, uh, one of the cells, the data centers that this system was running in was hard down and had been for hours. But my system was happy because it was running happily in the other place. It had lost no state. Everything was great. My system was running up to date, no problems at all. And that was when I kind of went, wow. This thing is magic. You know, this is technology that's making me not get paged, which is one of an S any SRE likes not getting paged, right? We all like that. So that was basically the moment that I decided to uh, take my master's thesis and write it about distributed consensus, because I think it's something that every SRE should know about and should care about. So this all happened in about 2013. I wrote this uh, thesis. Um, I handed it in. My university didn't quite know what to do with that, but that's OK. I passed. Everything was fine. And then a year or two later, uh, my boss at the time, Niall Murphy, was the person who was coordinating the um, O'Reilly SRE book. Is, has everyone seen the O'Reilly SRE book? Hands up. Yeah, OK, most people. Um, there's a lot of really good wisdom in there, and in fact, mostly in the other chapters. But nevertheless, um, I took my, my master's thesis and I distilled it down into a reasonable O'Reilly book chapter. And that's where uh, chapter 23, um, distributed consensus for managing state comes from. And this talk is pretty much that same chapter, but in, in a talk form. So anyone who's read that chapter really closely, you might want to go next door. <laughs> There's not much new here. So what I'm going to talk about today 
is mostly not going to be how distributed consensus works. There are quite a lot of papers written about that. There's a lot of good blog articles. My personal favorite is probably the paper trail. I think that's a really great um, site if you're curious about the, the workings of this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, the references from my SRE book chapter as well have lots of references about this. For SREs, the most important thing about distributed consensus is not exactly how does it work. It's knowing when we need to use it. It's knowing when we, we shouldn't use it. It's knowing how can it bite you, what can go wrong in, in production when you're operating these systems. How, do, how are we going to monitor them? All these things. And these are the things that you cannot get from the papers because these, this is the sort of the wisdom that we gained in SRE from, from running these big systems. And it wasn't just me working on the photon system as well. You know, I, I sat in the same building with the guys who run Spanner and who run F1 and who run Chubby and lots of other systems that use distributed consensus as well. So, um, and I got all of those really smart people to review my book chapter and they made it much better. So, if anybody was at SRECon Europe 2015, they may recognize this picture. Todd Underwood, who is one of the um, SRE leads in the US, he wants an automated pony. We want systems that just work. We don't want to babysit our systems. We don't want to clean up after them when they make a mess of themselves. We want them to be resilient to common types of failure as well as uncommon types of failure. We want them to be safe. And this really is the reason that we use distributed, consistent, uh, distributed consensus so much at Google. Um, like I said, we use it everywhere from the very biggest systems to the very smallest. So hopefully I'm convincing you here that consensus is good. But what is it? You can use systems that, um, you can build systems that don't use distributed consensus. And that's perfectly fine. But you should know what you're getting into. You should know why you don't need it for the particular systems when you don't need it. And I think the best way to start this talk is to look at some examples of where distributed consensus really should have been used, but wasn't. These, by the way, are real life examples of systems that I have, I have known about. I have not named names to protect the guilty, um, or at least uh, the people whose uh, systems they were. But these are real systems. This is, this is not made up stuff. So we have a service here that is composed of a sets of storage nodes. They're storing user data. And it's arranged in sets of pairs. So each, data, each piece of data is on two servers, a primary and a secondary. The primary and the secondary server for each set of data they, they're, they're doing heartbeats to each other. So, you know, every couple of seconds, sending each other a message to see if they're still alive. This is pretty standard so far. So what they do when the heartbeat goes away is that the server B, the, the secondary, um, it decides that server A has gone away, the old, the old um, primary has gone away, it should become the primary. Just for good measure, if the node can't talk to the other node, it sends a shoot the other node in the head uh, command, which basically says, hey, you know, please reboot yourself. You're, you're broken. So this is all very well in theory. And if your network is up and working fine, and your primary server has just had some kind of a glitch and hung itself, this will work. It'll do fine. Um, but in a case where you have a network that's just gone slow and unreliable, like it's dropping a lot of packets, but some of them are getting through, then you're going to get very inconsistent results with this method. You can end up with anything from both of the servers simultaneously decide the other one is dead, and they shoot each other, and both of the, uh, both of the shoot, shoot the other node in the head uh, packets get through. Then you have, you have no serving nodes at all. Um, you can end up with um, neither of them getting through, uh, but, and the heartbeat's not getting through. And then both sides of uh, the service decide that they're both the primary, and they'll both start accepting write operations and delete operations and modify operations. Basically, at this point, you have forked your user's data 
and you're, you're generating inconsistent copies of it. And that requires a whole bunch of cleanup when it happens. So this was a real outage, and the fact that um, they had a lot, of, a lot of data that got inconsistent uh, extended the time to repair quite a bit. Like, this, this was not a good thing. It's known as the split brain problem. And this is one of the big things that we see when we should have distributed consensus, but we do not. We're trying to solve a distributed consensus problem, which requires formally tested, tried and true distributed consensus protocols with a sort of a fairly intuitive, hacked together, but fundamentally flawed heartbeat protocol. And it just doesn't work. And there are probably 10,000 systems out there that are trying to do this very same thing and have that very same flaw. And you, know, you can go quite a long time without actually seeing any instances of this problem, but someday your network's gonna go flaky and you're gonna have this issue. Another similar post-mortem that I have seen goes a bit like this. So um, this group was running a kind of a search and indexing cluster. And what happened was the nodes would use a gossip protocol to, uh, to find each other and to share a state. And then the, the cluster would use this uh, protocol to elect one leader. And that leader was responsible for, for the kind of committing new data and deleting data and all the rest of it. So somewhat similar to the old system, but a little bit different. A gossip protocol, for anyone who isn't familiar, is basically each node um, tries to find some other nodes in the system and exchange some information. And it's sort of, it's non-deterministic, um, but statistically it works pretty well after, after a few hops. So again, you have a similar problem. You end up with a network partition, so you end up with two clusters and they're both making independent changes and you end up with an inconsistent state, inconsistent queries. If you have clients that can still talk to both sides of this, then they're, they're gonna end up with really confusing and strange results, which is what happened to this uh, organization. And again, if they were using distributed consensus to decide which processes were and weren't in the group, and they were using distributed consensus to elect a leader, then they shouldn't be able to have this situation. So again, group membership is uh, an application of distributed consensus, and one of these things is not like the other. So I had to use this um, damage gym, I'm a sysadmin, not a babysitter thing because I couldn't find one that says I'm an SRE, not a babysitter. Hopefully as our, as our, our profession gets more popular, we'll start uh, seeing those t-shirts because they're much cooler. But yeah, we really don't want as SREs to be tracking down and dealing with these sorts of messes. We want our systems to work better than this. So the distributed consensus problem, if you were a computer scientist, you would say that the distributed consensus problem deals with reaching agreement among a group of processes connected by an unreliable communications network. And this is true. So basically, any time that you have more than one process that needs to agree state, you need this. Just doing locking or, or, or state management on one single machine doesn't, but once you have processes connected by a network that you can't rely on, which is all networks, you have this problem. For a non-computer scientist, as an SRE, an easier way to think about this is distributed consensus problems are leader election, group membership, anything involving atomic broadcast or distributed queues. If you need to have a really strongly consistent replicated data store that's, that can deal with failure and recover gracefully, that's a distributed consensus problem. Or anything where you have to globally order events in a distributed system because I think hopefully we all know that you can't trust timestamps on different machines to agree with each other or to, or to oppose an ordering because of clock drift. So distributed consensus is all about trying to get as close to your traditional acid semantics. So your traditional kind of, you know, strongly consistent single data store semantics but on a, on a replicated system. I think probably everyone is aware that over the last 10 years or so, we've started to see a rise of other types of data stores, um, ones that are 
base, so basically available. They, they can deal with kind of, um, they can deal with data being a little different in different places and they will try and merge it or maybe your client will merge it like in the Dynamo system from Amazon. State is softer, consistency is eventual. So you can ask two different, you can query two different nodes in two parts of your system um, and you, you might get a different answer. With an ACID, uh, an ACID data store, you shouldn't. Google, as an organization, tends to very strongly favor ACID solutions. Um, one of the reasons that we do this, I think, is, is this uh, statement by Jeff Shoot. This is from the F1 paper. F1 is a data store that is actually a layer on top of Spanner, <coughs> adding some extra semantics. We find developers spend a significant fraction of their time building extremely complex and error-prone mechanisms to cope with eventual consistency and handle data that may be out of date. We think that this is an unacceptable burden to place on developers and that consistency problems should be solved at the database level. So one of the, the key pillars of SRE at Google is simplicity. Part of my job is explicitly to make the world a simpler place. And distributed consensus is one of those things. You can use distributed consensus to give your data stores these strong acid semantics, which makes life easier for your developers. Everything is more intuitive, easier to understand. And this, is, this, this makes you more likely to have a trouble-free system and less likely to hit weird, subtle bugs. And honestly, kind of data consistency and, you know, Data race type bugs are not things that anybody wants to have to deal with. So are there times when you don't want strong consistency? Yes, there absolutely are. This stuff is not free. In fact, it's quite expensive. Um, usually when we deploy a Paxos solution at Google, we have set five replicas will be kind of standard because you need a majority of them up in order to, to operate which means three. So that means if you've got five, you can have one down for planned maintenance, and then you can still tolerate a failure. So five is kind of our happy number. Higher than that is okay, but five is kind of where we usually go. That's not cheap. And there are some performance challenges around this, which are not insurmountable, but we do need to think about them. So if you don't need this kind of um, strong consistency, don't use it. Like, I mean, if, you, if you're running a system that is dealing with, say, you know, comments on blog posts. You could probably deal with a bit of um, eventual consistency. Um, I really, really like the Dynamo paper from Amazon, for instance, and um, they have a very good way of dealing with um, eventual consistency in that. In fact, this is one of the things, when, when we have uh, new, new, new Nooglers in, in SRE, um, this is one of the things that we teach them about. I kind of go, okay, here's, here's a counterpoint to to the way that Google builds distributed systems, go look at this, you know, just to keep your, your mind open. But for your critical data, the, thing, the, the kind of the data that's really critical to your system's basic correctness, I think distributed consensus is the only way. So things like, things like leadership, like we saw in my first anti-pattern, things like group membership, like we saw in my second anti-pattern. Um, these are relatively small pieces of state, and they're really important pieces of state. So this is a place where distributed consensus is perfect. So here is um, a one slide history of the field of distributed consensus. So it started off in 1985 when I, I was about yay high. Um, I think a lot of you probably were as well, if, and many of you probably not even born. Um, in 1985, we saw the uh, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson impossibility paper um, that was published. So basically the, the first uh, item in the history of distributed consensus is uh, the paper that says it's not possible, which was interesting. Um, and they're right. What, what the FLP result says is it's not possible to guarantee that your distributed consensus um, problem will progress if your network is, is not reliable. There are no guarantees of anything in life, but generally speaking, if, you're, if your network is basically available, your distributed consensus should be able to progress, and if some of your nodes will stay up long enough to commit transactions. So while this is true, it's not really helpful. Um, so along comes the late 1980s, and a guy called Leslie Lamport, very, very smart distributed systems engineer, 
And uh, he invented Paxos uh, while he was trying to improve it. Was, it was impossible. So he failed there, but he did invent a really cool protocol. The problem was it was ahead of its time. In the late 1980s, I mean, computing wasn't where it was now. People were you know, basically still building giant monolithic sort of mainframe-esque systems at that point. And so distributed consensus was sort of a computer science uh, curiosity almost. Also, um, the way that Leslie Lamport wrote his paper, he wrote it um, as, as basically a, he used a metaphor of parliamentarians on the Greek island of Paxos. And he sort of wrote it as a pseudo-historical story. And, uh, you know, his paper is technically correct and it's actually quite entertaining, but I think a lot of people didn't quite realize what he was getting at. He did subsequently uh, later write a, uh, a Pax, what was it called, Paxos Simplified or something? Um, he, he, wrote, he wrote the second paper that couched it more in computer science terms, and everyone kind of went, ah, that's what you were talking about, Leslie. So, um, during the 1990s, everybody ignored Paxos and distributed consensus mostly. Um, either they were confused or it didn't seem important at the time. 2001, um, the FLP paper from 1985 won the Dijkstra Prize. In the noughties, distributed consistence became really important as, you know, we all work for distributed systems companies. You know, none of us can run our systems on one box, I think. 2006, Google publishes the Chubby paper which I think was the first account of using distributed um, consensus in anger in real distributed <coughs> systems. And fairly close on its heels, three years later, we had Zookeeper. Zookeeper, Zookeeper started getting really popular because it was pretty easy to sort of, just sort of, even if your system wasn't really designed to use distributed consensus, Zookeeper provided a fairly easy API to use. And then in the 2010s, we just had this explosion of research um, and we had a couple more releases of pretty good open source um, distributed consensus implementations. So like I say, um, the FLP impossibility paper, you'll read it and you'll go, oh no, we can't do this. But like I say, in practice, it tends to work fine. So it's useful to have, like I say, I'm not going to go into the, the, the very, very nitty gritty, gory details of Paxos because, I mean, firstly, Paxos is only one possible distributed uh, consensus implementation. There are plenty of others, including Zab, which is the one that Zookeeper uses. And then secondly, we really need, only need to know enough to understand how it operates. So Paxos took the existing two-phase commit and three-phase commit protocols and basically it fixes problems with those. Two-phase commit works and it solves the distributed consensus problem, but the only problem is if one of your nodes uh, becomes unavailable, the whole thing will block. Um, Three-phase commit can't deal with something failing during committing a transaction. It doesn't have a good way to recover. But Paxos, as long as you can talk to a quorum, a majority of your nodes, your Paxos system can operate. So it's much more resilient than your traditional kind of database two-phase and three-phase commits. It has two phases in the, in the protocol. In phase one, a proposer which is one of the nodes, sends a prepare message. It includes a sequence number, and this sequence number is actually the, the absolute heart and soul of how Paxos works. Um, because the, the rule is the acceptors, the other nodes in the system, can only accept messages. They can only reply with a promise if that uh, transaction number is the highest that they've seen so far. And this is actually the, the piece of magic that stops the system from blocking and lets it recover. Then whenever the proposer gets a, a majority of um, agree messages or promise messages, it'll send an accept out um, to all the acceptors. And there's a few pieces of subtlety here. For example, the acceptors have to log to disk whenever they issue a promise so they don't renege on their promises if they restart at that point. So there is some, uh, there's some disk lag here. But the key thing to notice here, and you can see it in this diagram, you have two rounds of communication between the proposer and all the acceptor nodes. And all the acceptor nodes actually also communicate amongst themselves. And this requirement for the two rounds of network communication um, really gives rise to most of Paxos's interesting operational properties, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later. So just bear this in mind, two rounds of consensus. One of the major um, optimizations to the Paxos protocol, and it gives it essentially a 50% speed up, is a protocol called multi-paxos. What multi-paxos does is it basically says, 
the acceptor that wins the first round, uh, the proposer that wins the first round and manages to make the first proposal, that proposer is the only proposer until it, until it goes away. It basically gets a, a lease on the ability to propose. Um, that means that it can do proposals and acceptances in only one round of network traffic. And that makes it, your protocol much more efficient. But it's only one of several different optimizations to, to Paxos. So quick shout out to the other um, consensus al algorithms. View stamped replication, which was actually invented by Bar Bar Barbara Liskov, who's pretty famous, um, around the same time as Paxos, but just never gained traction. Um, I think everybody will have probably heard of Raft. Um, Raft was, uh, was devised actually to be easier to teach than Paxos rather than anything else. Um, and it seems to have worked because there has been an absolute rash of open source Raft implementations. <coughs> Zab is the protocol, it's quite similar to Paxos, but a little bit different. It is the one that lies under um, Zookeeper. Mencius is a um, interesting variant where, like multi-Paxos, you have designated proposer nodes, but it rotates around geographically, and egalitarian Paxos does something similar. So there are a whole, uh, there are a whole bunch of optimizations and different ways of doing the same basic thing. So here's the thing. Um, what take, took me a little bit of time to realize when I started researching and reading about distributed consensus algorithms is that actually Paxos on its own is not useful. You can't do much with it. You can commit a proposal, and then you can contact a quorum of the nodes to see if that proposal was committed, but that's not really a useful system component. You know, what you want as a system designer is a service that you can do something with. And that is why typically, Whenever, you see, whenever I've seen Paxos used in any practical system, it has been used to build as a building block to create a reliable system of some kind. And all of these are fundamentally a reliable replicated state machine. A replicated state machine is a set of processes replicated that execute the same operations deterministically in the same order. So they should wind up at the same result. So it looks something like this. You actually need two protocols executing on top of each other. At the bottom end, you have uh, the distributed consensus, which is the protocol used to commit all the operations. And then on top of that, you have the replicated state machine, which is doing something like providing a locking service, or a configuration service, or a, small, or a data store, or, or a queue. It could be any of those things. But what it's doing is, under the hood, whenever it's committing transactions, it's using Paxos. One of the other subtleties about Paxos is when you have five Paxos nodes, you can commit an, a transaction by talking to only three of them. What happens to the other two? They don't know what's happened. So let's say you have a node that you know, transiently drops off and comes back. It's got to catch up. So you actually have to have a, like a sliding window um, protocol in your replication state machine to, to allow that to happen. So think of, um, the Chubby paper is quite good on this. Actually, there's one called Paxos Made Live as well that talks about how Chubby architects this. So basically, it uses, um, it uses Paxos to order its log. And um, on top of that, Chubby acts as a little database. So this is really, really common. Um, one of the cool things about Raft, actually, which I think make, is one of the things that makes people understand it a bit better, is that Raft itself actually has the sliding window catch-up protocol built in, which is one of the major differences between it and basic Paxos. So one of the very most common things that I see people using distributed consensus for at Google is a thing called leader election. So basically, you have a bunch of processes, and they, they're all doing fundamentally the same thing. But one of them is the leader. And we use this all the time when we write a little bit of automation. So I think all SRE teams in the world probably have a bunch of little services that exist to do something, you know, like a little service that exists to, to find bad, broken things in your system and fix them or to, you know, run, run a backup or something like that. And, of course, what happens is, you know, you're running your little service and it's all fine, um, but, you know, someday some, someone comes along and is doing maintenance on the cluster where your, your service is running. And now, oh no, your, your, your SRE services are not running. So what we do in Google all the time 
is we, ha we will always run three or five identical instances of any piece of automation. And if it's just a small piece of automation with no major kind of performance or bottlenecking issues needing sharding, we will simply say, okay, we're gonna use Chubby to have, to have one of these instances take a lock. It'll hold that, it'll hold that lease. We never, we never lock anything permanently. We take a lease for some period of time. But we will have one process periodically renew this lease and stay the leader. And it'll be the one doing all the work. But if it goes away for some reason, one of the other ones will just seamlessly take over. And this is a, a super useful application of uh, distributed consensus. I know it seems really simple, but you know, it saves us a lot of time. So um, any sort of distributed queue is another example. Um, distributed queues are great. Um, they're a really common um, kind of design pattern in, in distributed systems if you want to distribute pieces of work in any sort of batch or pipeline system. So illustration, you can use uh, distributed consensus to manage the state for that in, in a queue. You can use them for locking. So if you have a problem where, for example, you need to implement a distributed barrier operation. So you've got a bunch of processes doing some work in multiple phases. Let's say you've got, call it a map phase and a reduce phase. You want all your maps to finish before you start your reduces. You need a barrier and you can use distributed consensus running as a replicated state machine to do that. Just as some trivial examples, you can also implement configuration stores, which is what the whole Chubby paper is about and pretty much you know, what Zookeeper mostly does as well. You can, build, you can build a database on top of it. If you read the Photon paper, that's you know, an, an example of a, a very specialized data store that we built using Paxos. And then you have all the way up to Spanner, which is uh, you know, Google's giant, uh, pretty much SQL compliant distributed consensus database. So, geography. One of the great benefits of distributed consensus is you can run your system all the way across the globe like Spanner does, or like Spanner can, you don't have to. Um, and you can have all the instances of your service cooperate together as one replicated state machine. However, one issue here is latency. There is something like 100 milliseconds of latency across the Atlantic, depending exactly where you're going from Europe um, to, to the US. And across the Pacific, it, it, it's even worse, right? So why is latency a problem? So like we said before, we have two phases. Um, even when we're using the uh, multi op uh, optimization, we need one round trip uh, between the proposer and our acceptors. So we are bounded by the latency between our nodes. And most of us like to distribute our data, our, uh, our data centers, our, our clusters pretty widely geographically because that makes sense. We want to be close to our users. We want to have geographical diversity against disasters. There's all sorts of good reasons to do it. But if we're not careful about how that affects our distributed consensus systems, we may be disappointed in the performance. Uh, one of the ways this manifests is, I mentioned before the, the multi-Paxos optimization where we have one of the, the five Paxos nodes basically stays the leader, and that is the node that all of the commits need to go through. So clients don't just go to their nearest node, they go to the proposer node. So if you're running a whole bunch of geographically distributed uh, nodes, let's say you've got one in San Francisco, one in Dublin, and one in New York. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're the service that's running in New York and the leader is in San Francisco, it's not too bad. You've got maybe 50 milliseconds uh, round trip. If you're in Dublin, you're gonna have a, a bad time. And this is what we see here. Uh, we have nearby processes have good latency, further away processes have less good latency. So there are variants of um, distributed consensus that can address this. I mentioned before a protocol called Mencius and a protocol called Egalitarian Paxos, and both of those, they actually, they use the multi-Paxos, uh, they use something similar to the multi-Paxos um, optimization in where there is a, a leader process that each commit has to go through. But what they do is they rotate it around based on the transaction number. So each of the nodes gets a chance to be the leader. So this can help a little bit the distant processes. This is not something, unfortunately, that we've implemented at Google to my knowledge, but hopefully it's something that we might do in the future um, because for some of our applications, it could be really helpful. 
So the round trip time issue, um, if, you're, if you have a 100 millisecond round trip time between your processes, that means that you can only commit 10 times a second, and that sucks, right? No, nobody can deal with that, unless your services are very, very small. This is one of the reasons why, why this talk is, uh, or well, why the book chapter was called Critical State, Not All Your State. But there are ways that you can make this better. Uh, we used to do this in Photon. There's a lot of batching and pipelining. So in Photon, we had a very, very large Paxos based data store. And what we did is we sharded the data. It was kind of simple key value. So shard the data into different domains. Each of them is running distributed consensus independently. You can also batch multiple changes into the same transaction and then apply it as a, as a set, as long as they're, they're not related. So if you were modifying um, the same piece of data multiple times in each transaction, the ordering would not be clear. And you can use pipelining. So you can start the next transaction before your first, the previous one has uh, finished in the same way that we kind of pipeline uh, TCP over a slow wire. So those are some optimizations that we can use to make our throughput better. But you have to think about this ahead of time when you're designing your system. So batching and pipelining. So sometimes more replicas can actually make your system less reliable. And that's what this slide is showing you. So I mentioned before that five is typically how we deploy our, uh, our systems. If we had a sixth node, uh, if we say, we're, for example, we're, we're replacing one of our older processes with a newer one, if we're running six in five data centers, then if we lose um, one data center, then we're actually we're not in any better position. If we have six nodes, we need a um, majority of four in order to commit anything. So that means we can lose we can lose two of four, and you're more likely to lose sorry two of six, and you're more likely to lose two of six than you are two of five. So actually, this is a six nodes makes your system less reliable. Seven is better. Um, you're better off if you can spreading your nodes out into different failure domains. So if, you have, uh, if you're running five nodes, but you have two of them in data center A, two of them in data center B, and one in data center C, um, you can really only tolerate a loss of a single data center if it's A or C. So try and spread them out into as, as many different failure domains as you can. This is a fun thing that can happen. So um, I only, there's only three nodes in this diagram because, uh, because diagrams are hard. So let's say we have three data centers, A, B, and C. Data center A is on the left here, and it has the leader. We're running a big sharded distributed consensus system here, and, it, and the leaders prefer to be in data center A. It turns out that we have really good um, connectivity between data center A and data centers B and C. One interesting property of Paxos is that the, ex the acceptor, or the proposer node, always uses more bandwidth talking to the um, acceptors than the other way around, because it needs to send out the values to the acceptors. And the acceptors only send out a small response. Like, it's basically just yes, no, and the transaction ID. So you've got this very, very asymmetric flow of data. Sort of, it's, it's fundamentally not different to if you're running um, any, any kind of secondary replication. So if the data center A on the left here suddenly goes away, we can end up with this. If the leaders all move en masse to our data center at the top, then we have suddenly have this big demand for bandwidth from the top cell to the bottom cell. And if that is not available, then we're going to have a bad time. Our, our distributed consensus is not going to work very well. So if you are running a, a very high throughput distributed consensus system, one of the things to think about is spreading your leader processes around the place, and also to test to make sure that this scenario can't happen. I mean, test how it actually runs with only, only a quorum of your nodes up. So we already talked a bit about latency. So if we have a system running like this with five nodes, two in kind of the middle of the US, one in New Yorkish, and a couple in Europe, um, they can all commit in sort of reasonable time because you have this node in the middle kind of joining the domains, right? If we lose that, suddenly the smallest geographical quorum becomes a lot wider. Hmm? Oh, sorry. How's that? 
Better? Ready? Oh, it's not the lecture. Sure. I don't have too much time to go. How's that? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so suddenly our smallest uh, geographical quorum becomes a lot bigger and everything's going to get slower and that's going to suck. But there are things that we can do about this. There is a concept called the hierarchical quorum that we can use. So instead of having um, just a simple majority as a quorum, we can divide our, um, ourselves up into smaller groups. So this one shows a system where we have um, three, three subsets. And a quorum in this system can, actually, can be any majority. It has to be a majority of, um, of cells and a majority of instances in the cells. So what can happen here is we can lose one, or two, one of the um, instances in the middle cluster without actually affecting the, the ability to form a quorum between any two of the other ones. Another fairly well-known anti-pattern for distributed consensus is a thing called dueling proposers. So what this looks like is this. We have our two oh. Sorry, no more walking around for me. Uh, we have our two phases. So in phase one, our proposer tries to propose a transaction. And um, what happens is before the acceptors get around to, um, to accepting it and the, the round finishes, someone else proposes with a higher number. And this can keep going on basically forever. Um, as sort of a form of live lock. So we, t we tend not to have problems with this, but that's because we think about um, basically back off. Using the multi pack sus optimization will, will help with, that, with this because you're going to change your proposer less frequently, uh, which is important. So scaling your read throughput. Um, for many applications, most of your activity is going to be in reads. So strongly consistent reads, um, reads that respect the ACID properties that we talked about, actually require you to do a full consensus round, same as the writes. Um, you've got to communicate with a majority of the nodes to find out what the deal is. However, um, there are a couple of optimizations so if you're using a consensus protocol like Multipaxos, um, where you have one strong leader node that makes all the proposals, that node can actually give you a definitive answer for any query, which is nice. Uh, it does mean that the load on that particular node is going to be a lot higher, which is the downside of this. But it does mean that you can optimize in that way. So this is done in Chubby, for instance. And one of the ways that we also scale the load on that node is to use a system of proxies and caching. And uh, if you read the chubby paper with an eye to how it does that with the caching, it's pretty interesting. There's another technology called quorum leases. So you can do this in a system where you have more reads than writes. Um, so what the, what the system will do is it will grant a, a read lease on a subset of the replicas and basically guarantee that as long as the, that lease is valid, there won't be any writes unless all of the processes that, have a, that are in the read quorum actually acknowledge that it's okay to do the write. So what you can end up with there is you can end up with higher latency on your writes because first the proposer has to revoke the leases and if one of the processes that has a read lease is not available, you've got to wait until the lease is up. So that can make your tail latency bad, but it can improve your read latency a lot, so that can be quite beneficial. So there are distributed consensus systems that do not require all the reads to be strong reads. And by, by this I mean it's okay to sometimes read stale data that's not fully up to date. So I've talked already about the photon system and it is an example of a system that does this. And the reason is that stale data will cause that system to do some more work. So it will repeat work that it's already done but it uses a compare and set operation. So this is similar to how atomic registers work. You say, I want to commit this value, and the value that I believe exists there already is this. If that is true, then set it in an atomic fashion. So that's a really useful operation to have. Um, so your, your, your processes can read some data and, and commit only on the basis that that data was correct. So. Pretty much the end here. So one final thing to think about is monitoring. Um, like everything else, your distributed consensus systems require monitoring. Particularly important things to think about here are the number of instances that are up. So for example, if you think you're running five of these things and you, know, you have a couple of failures and it turns out that you've got three, 
that's a bit, that's a bad thing, and you should uh, you should know about that, and you should bring some more instances up. Um, there's a health and a status kind of thing. So healthy is up and connected and processing normally. You can also have like a lagging catch-up state. So after a after a node has been down and has come back, it'll be catching up data for a while. It can also be lagging because it's too far away from the, the quorum of the other nodes. If you are running one of the optimizations of uh, distributed consensus that uses a consistent leader, um, like multipack sauce, a very important thing to monitor is how often the leadership is changing. If that's happening, you don't expect that to happen often. If it is happening often, it's a sign that something is flaky in your system. There's also the transaction ID, which I talked about earlier. We expect that to always be increasing in your system. And every time a transaction is committed, it should increase. So you should monitor what was the last transaction ID committed and make sure that it isn't going down. That would indicate something is very, very broken in your system. I'd like to add a fundamental logical sense. Um, and you should check that it's, it's making progress. And then the usual things that you would uh, you'd monitor in any system, errors and request latency. So um, I'm just going to finish off and give you guys some further reading. One of the best papers that I've ever read about this for SREs is How to Build a Highly Available System Using Distributed Consensus by Butler Lampson. Then, um, like I say, I'm, I'm a fan of the Consensus Protocol series by Henry Robinson. Um, that's the paper trail. So he's, he's got three really good articles on the differences between two-phase and three-phase commit and Paxos. So this, this will actually tell you how the protocols work in detail. But the Lampson's paper is mostly about how do I build a system that uses these things. And then Paxos Made Live is a really cool paper. It is a account that was written about, I guess, the first couple of years of implementing Chubby and running it at Google. And it has all sorts of wisdom. Like, for example, the section there about testing distributed consensus uh, is very, very good. And that, to be honest, is one of the most challenging things about any distributed, imp implementing distributed consensus is not hard. Testing it to make sure it's bug-free and finding and fixing the bugs is really the hard part. And then, for specifically some of the information in this talk in more detail, particularly the performance and the reliability stuff, um, chapter 23 of the SRE book is what this talk is all based on and has everything in quite a bit more depth. <laughs>